Amen. Amen. That's what some of those too high. Yeah. That's what some of those would call one of those oldies but goodies. Just to think about the amazing grace of God. What He's done in your life, what He's brought you through. and I just don't understand how sometimes we can put God on the back burner so much. And my heart is broken this morning. And today's message is going to be difficult. But I won't apologize for what I'm about to tell you. I struggled this week with some things that uh, bothered me about the church. I'm not just talking about Resurrection Church. I'm talking about corporate church in America across this country. And I'm, I'm, I'm sad because it's, it's sickening is what it is, to be honest with you. If I can just be honest with you. It's, just, it's sick at what we've done to God and what we don't do for God. I'm not here to step on anybody's toes. I want to hit you in the heart. Because if I hit you in the heart, you're going you're gonna to remember when you leave today. And whether you come back or not, that's not on me. That's on you. Because I'm going to tell you the truth today. If you don't hear anything else today that's the truth, you're going to hear the truth. And I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation in 2 Timothy chapter number 3 is where I'm going to start. But I'm going to read about 10 verses. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. I'm going to be reading verses 16 and 17. And then I'm going to flow right on over into... Chapter number 4. You know, worship is very, very important to God. It just is. Worship is important. When you, when you read about King David, the Bible's pretty clear that King David, the, the, the kingdom, when he was the king, advanced more when King David was over than any other king. And what do we know David as? Somebody who worshipped the Lord and danced for the Lord and sang praises to the Lord. That's no different in today's times. God still desires our worship and our praise. But we can come in here and I'm not being ugly. Heaven help me this morning. God, I need your Holy Spirit to touch these people so they'll understand what I'm trying to say. But we can come in here and we can stand and we look like we've been sucking on lemons all week long and we say... Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. God didn't call me to sing, so I know that was terrible. <laughs> but that's my point. You act like you have nothing to praise God for. And I don't understand that. Could you imagine that God said, well, you didn't praise me, so you ain't getting Jack Diddley squat coming this upcoming week. There ain't no more protection for me. There's no more provisions for me. You figure it out for yourself. If you're, if you're not careful, if you can look at this country, that's what this country has been doing for years. They take him out of the schoolhouses. They take him out of the courthouses. They take, him out of, uh, they take prayer out of schools. They want to take his name off of the money. And slowly but surely, I think God was getting to a point where He was pulling His hand off of the world. And He said, you want a world without God? I'll give you that world without God. And y'all know the hell and the turmoil that's been going on for the last 60 or 70 years. You've seen it increasingly, it grew. We had somebody come on the scene. His name was Dr. Martin Luther King. And what did he want to do? He wanted unity to come and people to come together. He was preaching and teaching something that none of us had ever heard before. But it was what we needed to hear. And then what? Some idiot that was, that was uh, demon-possessed committed uh, assassination on one of the greatest men that ever walked the face of the earth. I tell you that even if these black folks wasn't sitting in here. That's the truth. And then what happens? The divide stayed, and now the divide's getting stronger. It's nothing but the enemy, y'all. 
Why? Because we as Christians are not guarding ourselves, our families, our hearts, our churches. We want to come in here and sit on our hands and act like God ain't done nothing for us. I don't understand it. I don't get it. You know, uh, we've been having this prayer thing now for several, several weeks. I'm just going to say what God's put on my heart. This is not malice coming out of my soul. This is, uh, God is breaking my heart for this. Yeah. We've had this prayer thing going on for weeks and I, where is the folks? I want a move of God, but I don't want to do anything for it. Come on. Yeah. You, you don't think that it, just because you have a job that you don't think that God's going to give you adequate rest in four hours versus you getting a full eight or nine hours? Come on. Come on. God knows how to turn the time back yeah. for you and your heart because of what you're doing for Him. Well, I can just pray at home. Sure you can. Sure you can. But there's nothing like sacrificing for God. That's right. I'm talking about a straight up sacrifice. I'll come up here. I'm not patting myself on the back at all. I don't do that. Y'all know I don't. I sit down and let somebody else preach. I'll come up here. I'll be at the church from sometimes 7, 7.30. I'll get here. I'll leave here about 11 sometimes, 11.30. I'll go home for about 10 minutes. And then I'll leave and I'll go to their prayer service at 12. <laughs> I still got a job. I still have a family. But I have a wife that supports me and knows that I want to see a move of God. And to see a move of God, you've got to do something. That's right. That's right. Jeremiah 29 and 11 was nowhere in my notes, but i got to tell you about it. Everybody knows Jeremiah 29 and 11, don't you? No. You don't? All right, I'm fixing to tell you. I, I appreciate your honesty because God knows that somebody needs to hear this. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29 and 11... It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not evil, to give you a future and a hope. And we hold on to that and say, God, you got me a future and you got me a hope. Praise the Lord. Send it to me. But there's more. But there's more. We've got to stop cherry picking these scriptures to try to have an abundant and blessed life and start reading the rest of the story. Y'all remember Paul Harvey when he used to get on there and he would do his little things on the, on the uh, news and on the radios and he would say, but the rest of the story. Yeah. Right after 11 comes what? 12. 12 says this. It says, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. Come on. Come on. Wait a minute now, I've never heard that. I've just heard that you've had a plan for me and you knew me before my mother's womb. That's all I've ever heard. But now you're telling me that I've got to call upon you and pray to me and you will hear me then? That's right. And then he goes on, what comes after 12, 13. He goes on and he says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. That's right. right. Wow. Wow. Now, I'll let you look at it either way you want to. I'll let you look at it either way you want to. He's got a plan for you. Great. You hold on to that. The Bible says the word in, in, in verse number 12, it says then. So you got that plan. Then you're going to call upon him and pray to him and, and you're going to seek him and find him when you seek him with all your heart. Let's go that route. Are you at least doing that much? Come on. If you're not, are you wandering around aimlessly and don't know what the plan for your life is? Okay, cool. You're not going to get that plan for your life until you call upon Him and pray to Him and seek Him and turn from your wicked ways. And there's an order of stuff that we've got to do. It's not just hand it out to you. Do you just give stuff to people or just, just because all the time? You work for a paycheck, don't you? Now, you can't work your way into heaven. Don't you, don't you misunderstand what I'm saying. You can't work your way into heaven. But the Bible says that there's higher heights and there's deeper depths than you and I have ever experienced. You know how you get that? By sacrificing and seeking the face of God. I know how easy it is to sit at home in your recliner with your feet propped up. I get it. 
Some people would rather sit at home and watch the service online with their feet propped up. If COVID did anything, it exposed the faithful. That's right. Right. But you know, people would rather sit at home and watch it on TV or on Facebook. You know, it's not the same. No. It's not. Because when the Atlanta Braves was playing for the World Series, how many people paid thousands of dollars to go watch their games, even the away games, Why? Because they wanted to be in the atmosphere. They wanted to be in an atmosphere with like-minded people seeking the same thing. Church is no different. It's not the same as watching it on TV as it is of being in the atmosphere with people who are seeking the same thing. But it's so easy for us to sit at the house and I've got to work. Tomorrow, so I guess I'll just stay home. I remember as a kid, they used to tell me something that was just, right now it just seems like it's just so elementary. But could you imagine if, if Christ, when He was in the Garden of Gethsemane and He was praying in the Garden, the pressing? Could you imagine what would happen? And He was just like, well, I guess I'll just lay down. I don't want to do this anymore. Where would we be? You couldn't sing Amazing Grace. I tell you that. Come on. Come on. So where are we to give thanks back to God and say, Lord, let me, let, me, let me get out of my comfort zone. Let me do something different so I can see something different. That's right. Hallelujah. But if I keep doing the same thing, guess what I'm going to get? I'm going to get the same thing. Yeah, that's right. They call that insanity, don't they? That's right. So God, I want to do something different. That's right. Some, some, some folks drove from Macon and Savannah and Sandersville just to have midnight prayer at Power Chapel. Yeah. We can't even get people to drive from Louisville across town. Right. Huh. I know it hurts, but I'm just being serious. It's, it's the truth. But then we want to sit and wonder why God ain't filling the house up. I told you two years ago that He told me that you cannot have your house full until your house is full. When He told me that, I was like, God, that's got to be one of the craziest things I've ever heard anybody say. Of course, that makes sense. But no, when you really think about it, until your house gets full, this house will never be full. Why? Because people have no desire to come to a dead church. Uh, I, can, I can go sit at the gas station and get more Jesus than I can in some of the Come churches. On. Come on. I told you this wasn't going to be popular, but God didn't call me to be popular. That's right. I was reading about some of the prophets and some of the preachers, and some of them were depressed and alone. Yeah. Absolutely. Some of them wanted to kill themselves. One of them laid up underneath the juniper tree and wanted to die because a woman was chasing him after he just watched God kill 450 prophets. We've seen a move of God before, but where's the unction to say, God, I want more than what you've already given me? We can't stop with what God is already doing. We build off of it. It's building blocks. Your faith is supposed to be taking you from glory to glory. Come on. And, and, and we, we cannot do that by getting complacent. Complacency will kill you. Absolutely. It will destroy you. Absolutely. There is no comfort in Christianity. Come on. You have to make sacrifices. That's right. Every day you make a sacrifice when you walk out your door to say, I'm going to live for Jesus. Does that sound like a a, a small sacrifice? To most of us, it does seem like a small sacrifice. But to others, it's not even a thing. We only live for God on Sunday mornings. You're not doing yourself for the kingdom of any favors if you plan on just living for God on Sundays. That's right. God, I want to see something different. Let me do something different. You want somebody to support your move? You better support somebody else's move. Absolutely. It's not just about you and your move. 
You want somebody to show up to your stuff? You got to show up to their stuff. If God called you to do something, He called them to do something, you need to support each other. And me, as the pastor, you keep coming to this church for some reason, and I don't know what it is. Just last week, the roof was leaking like a sift over here. Whole floor was wet and stained and everything else. The awning out there has still got off on ugly. But you still keep coming to church for some reason. Why? Because somewhere deep in your spirit, God has told you that He has chosen a man of God in a storefront church that will tell the truth no matter what. And you want to see the move of God. You want to be part of it. That's why you keep coming. There's nothing else that I have to offer but the truth. That's right. Come on. So that's why you keep coming. You've got to make sacrifices to God. And if, he's, if, if you feel like this is the place because of, 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 of what, the, what God has given me, then why don't you trust me to help me when I ask you to do something? Come on. I'll speak for all pastors across the country, including Pastor Harold. Miss Zena said it in the group the other day. You know why she can't be here? Because she's got cancer. That's right. She's going through cancer treatments right now. But if she could be here, she would. She even came when she was sick. That's right. Believe your pastor. Believe in your pastor. Listen to your pastor. God chose him for a reason. You don't want to come to midnight prayer because it's too late? You don't want to come to 9 o'clock prayer because it's too late? What if God gave up on you that time when He dropped the cross and He fell on His face traveling to Golgotha and He looked over at Simon and Cyrene and said, you carry it. What if Jesus would have said, no, don't worry about it. I quit. That's right. It's too hard. It's too much. I don't want to do this anymore. You and I would not have a hope in this world. That's right. That's right. And I thank you, God, for being able to sit at home on my behind and not join people for corporate prayer and corporate worship. That's, right. That's not malice from my heart because I told y'all in the beginning I'm going to do it whether nobody shows up. That's right. But this is a gut check for you. Individually, are you supporting your pastor and your church to be able to move the kingdom of God forward. I guess I can read now. In 2 Timothy chapter number 3. I told you I was going to be reading in the Passion Translation. Just because uh, I just like it. And in verse 16 it says that every scripture has been written by the Holy Spirit. The breath of God. It will empower you by its instruction and correction. Giving you the strength to take the right direction and lead you deeper into the path of godliness. Mm. Then you will be God's servant. Come on. Fully mature and perfectly prepared to fulfill any assignment God gives you. Are you listening to these words? You know that the Passion Translation, typically people don't like it. But you know what it is? It's plain English. It's plain English. In verse 4 it says, this is Paul writing his final letter from prison in Rome in about 67 AD to a young man named Timothy who he met when he was traveled in his uh, country. It starts with an L. I can't remember the name of it right now. Greg probably knows it off the top of his head. But when he traveled there, see, Timothy was cast out. Timothy wasn't liked in his community. Why? Because his mom and his daddy was mixed. That's right. One was from Greek and one was from uh, a Jew. So when he would go to this side, they would say, no, you got just a little bit too much Jew in you. Then he would go to that side and say, no, you got just a little bit too much of the other side on you. So he was already lonely. But when Paul come to preach in that community, Timothy heard something that he had never heard before and he attached himself to Paul. What are you preaching? Is it enough for people to attach themselves to you? Come on. Is it enough for people to say, I want to be around you tomorrow? That's right. Is it enough for you to say, I want to be around you on Fridays? What are you preaching? 
So Timothy attached himself to Paul. So Paul has been writing these letters from prison and he writes this one here, his final letter from prison. And he tells young Timothy, he says that Timothy in the presence of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was destined to judge both the living and the dead by the revelation of his kingdom, I solemnly instruct you to proclaim the word of God and stand upon it no matter what. I changed my name to Timothy today, just so you know. That's what God has done to me. God has called me and He has chosen me and He told me, He said, John, I solemnly instruct you to proclaim the Word of God and stand upon it no matter what. Then He said, rise to the occasion and preach when it is convenient and when it is not. That's right. right. Preach in the full expression of the Holy Spirit with wisdom and patience as you instruct and teach the people. Come on. That's why I'm telling you that what's burdened on my heart is from the Lord. This isn't malice out of my heart. About six or eight months ago, I probably would have preached from malice out of my heart because I didn't know how to contain my emotions. But now I do. I'm not mad at what you've done or what you haven't done. I'm telling you what the Word of God says. And I can't go wrong when I preach the Word of God. That's right. That's right. And then he says, For the time is coming when they will no longer listen and respond to the healing words of truth because they will become selfish and proud. Come on. We do not see that in this country today, do we? Mm-hmm. Every day, folks run around with pride. And selfishness and malice in their hearts. That's right. And most of them call themselves Christians. Exactly. They think that they're a Christian, but they are more bitter than a bag of lemons. That's right. And then the Bible says that they will seek out teachers with soothing words that line up with their desires, saying just what they want to hear. Come on. Maybe that's why this house ain't full. Because I'm not going to compromise the Word of God to make you feel good about yourself. Say ouch and amen because I read it before you ever hear it. How about that? I get it too. When he was preaching this morning, he said, some of y'all don't want to hear this preaching. I said, I do. I'm going to start wearing a size shoe about two or three sizes too big so he can't reach my toes. That's why I told you I want to hit you in the heart this morning. Because if I hit you in the heart, you're going to remember what I'm telling you. And then he said that they will close their ears to the truth and believe nothing but fables and myths. Tell me the stories. Tell me the fake stories. That's the stuff that I want to hear. That's what a fable is. I don't want to hear the truth anymore. I don't want you to stand on some kind of uh, faithful doctrine. I don't need to hear that. You, you make me mad and you make me not want to come back when you tell me those kinds of things. And if I lie to you and tell you something else, I'm damning myself. That's right. Because one day when we get to heaven and I have to stand before God, I have to have an account for every word that I've spoken. So it's not anger or malice coming from me. It's, it's humility trying to tell you uh, with, with, with the patience that the Bible talks about what God desires from His people. He, he would love nothing else than to see His people gathering seven days a week on their faces praying to Him and saying, God, just move. God, just do something different. God desires that. That's biblical. He desires those to worship Him with spirit and in truth. That's the Bible. But then it goes on to say, So be alert to all these things and overcome every form of evil. Carry in your heart the passion of your calling. As a church planter and evangelist and fulfill your ministry calling. Do you know that if you don't sit here under the call of God 
and you decide to leave because of something that I say that's biblical, he's going to send somebody in here to replace you. Absolutely. The move of God is not going to stop because you decide you don't want to come back to church here. So with that being said, I'm going to apologize to God up front for trying to do what He is supposed to do. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I can't make you move. I can't cause you to move. I can no longer be the head cheerleader on the cheerleading squad here at Resurrection Church. That's, right. That's not my job. I remember going to football games, and, and, and believe it or not, I was good at football at one time. Right now, I would break a leg and gravy would pour out. I promise you. <laughs> but there was just something about the cheerleaders on the side that would get the crowds pumped up yeah, that's right. to get them up off of their seat, to be able to chant the name of the mascot, to be able to pull for the team so you could win. It just does something on the inside of your soul, does it not? Yeah. Nobody should have to get up in a pulpit and cheer you on on Sunday mornings as a cheerleader to tell you that God has been good to you. That's right. <clears throat> Nobody should have to tell you, hey, I, where are y'all at? Why, why, why aren't you taking every opportunity to be in the house of God? Why aren't you taking every opportunity to go worship with somebody else? Nobody should have to tell you that. So, so the days of, of, of me being the cheerleader, I can't do a herky or a toe touch anyway. I can't even do a front roll without getting dizzy. That's the truth. I can't even get on a swing without getting dizzy. <laughs> I can't be, be the cheerleader of the church. I wasn't called to be the cheerleader. I was called to be the pastor and the preacher of this church. And the Bible says that I'm supposed to preach what the Word of God says. And that's what I'm going to do. See, so if I had to title this thing today, it says, I can't do it, but God can. You need to say that to yourself in every situation of your life. I can't do it, but God can. See, I can't make you move, but God can. But there's something that I have to do. I have to spend time in the Word and time in prayer to know that I'm hearing a word from God because believe it or not, God knows you better than you know yourself. He knows exactly what you need to hear. And believe it or not, if it's just one person in here, somebody needed to hear this today. That's right. But I can't get discouraged anymore. And I told you, I, I quit getting discouraged a long time ago. That's why for the last eight months, I don't preach with malice and anger. Because I have, I have put it in my heart that I know what God called me to do. You're sitting in chairs that were donated from another church in North Georgia as we were about to purchase 60. And they're about 40 to $50 a chair. The sound system at the top and the, the, the mixing board in the back was donated to us by another church. When we first moved in, the lady said, y'all fix it however you want to. Do not pay me rent until you open the doors. Don't even pay a deposit. My point is this. God has shown me too much to not believe. So my point is this. I love you so much. That's why I have been harping on do this, do that, come here, go there. We've got to do this for God. That's why I love you so much. But if this move of God does not include you, then that's on you and God. I know what He's called me to do. And I'm going to do it. We're going to meet for prayer. And I can't, I, I can't get discouraged that nobody shows up because if I remember reading the Bible correctly, Jeremiah preached for 40 years without any kind of movement from people. Could you imagine, Pastor, preaching for four Sundays without a move? 
Come on. How about preaching for four decades? Come on. And it feeling like it falling on deaf ears. But Jeremiah didn't quit. He didn't give up. Jeremiah, I told you the other day, I, I kind of feel like Jeremiah. The only difference between me and Jeremiah is he was called at 17. I wasn't. Another difference between me and Jeremiah is he was told not to have any kids or any wives, and that knocks me out too. <laughs> but where Jeremiah and I are the same is he was known as the weeping prophet because he cried for the people. He desired for the people to come to know this God. He desired for Israel to stop doing the stuff that they were doing. That's what I do. Y'all don't even know how much I cry. Can I tell you what Riker told me yesterday? He roasted me. He roasted me yesterday. And she laughed about it. I was doing what daddies do and I was aggravating him. And I called him a crybaby. He said, well, you cry at church. <laughs> and I do. But it's because my heart has turned to mush. I can't stand to see people say that they're one thing and then do another. Some of us walk around with our nose stuck so high up in the air that a helicopter's going to chop it off. We need to be knocked off of our high horse and walk around with humility. So Jeremiah preached for 40 years, but he stayed faithful to God. You better quit smiling at me, boy. Or I'm going to start crying. But if you read another story in the Bible, I like the story of Ezekiel in the Valley of the Dry Bones. I like to think as Louisville as this valley with dry bones. And Ezekiel had this vision of these bones just scattered all over the valley. And he, he walked around them several times. But do you know what God didn't tell him to do? He didn't tell him to go down there and start putting the bones together. That's what he didn't tell him to do. That's what I feel like I've been trying to do. I didn't study anatomy, so I wouldn't know where they go anyhow. But God didn't call me to do that, and He didn't call Ezekiel to do that. You know what He called Ezekiel to do? Prophesy. That's right. He called him to speak to the valley of dry bones. And what happened? A little bit of noise, a little bit of shaking. The bones begin to come together at the word of the Lord given through the prophet. That's right. Yeah, that's right. My job is to preach and let God do His thing. Right. So no longer can I force the bones to come together, Katie. <laughs> if it's just me and you and Zayd and the family, that's who it's going to be. If it's just us and Matthew, that's just who it's going to be. Miss Donna, that's just who it's going to be. If it's just me, that's who it's going to be. I can't force the bones to come together. I can only speak the Word. But you know what happens in most of the churches today? And I know the word resurrection and we shouldn't worry about all the other churches. But I say differently because you can preach to people yeah. when you leave this place. Absolutely. Okay. So what's happening? All There's a little bit of noise and there's a little bit of shaking. But they did not stand up to be an exceeding great army until the wind came. That's right. Until the breath of God came across that valley, then they stood up an exceeding great army. We need the wind of God to pass by our way. Oh, okay, I do. I guess none of y'all need it, but I need it. I need the wind of God to pass through here. That's right. I wouldn't care if he sat on us like a hurricane for a while. Come on. Because there's more to God than what we've seen. That's right. But we can't get it being complacent and comfortable. That's right. Complacent Christianity will put you in the dirt. Yeah. Only serving God when it's convenient to you is not the way to do it. That's right. 
I gave you exactly what God told me to give you this morning. Katie, if y'all get your last song ready. Y'all got one more, right? The only thing that I'm going to tell you, church, is I can't be the cheerleader of the church. I wasn't called to be a cheerleader. I want you to succeed. I want your ministry to explode. I want God to do a work in what you're doing. I do. I want to have girls up here dancing like crazy. I want to have Bible study slap full. I really do. But I can't do this by myself. And God never said that I could. I'm asking the church to stand with me and help. Do what God has called us to do. Because if you're here under the sound of my voice and you've been coming to this church, you're called to do something besides keep that chair warm. There's a reason that it's covered. It can keep itself warm. The back of our shirt says to love God, love people, and serve the world. Where's our servant heart? You know, it starts in prayer. It starts in prayer. I would ask you to do business with God this morning as you see fit. If there's some areas in your life that God needs to fill, these altars are going to be open and we're ready to pray with you as needed. Let's all stand.